The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Macquarie Investment Management Australia Limited, ABN 55092552611, AFSL 238321 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right time, the right way for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Introducing Macquarie ETFs. Macquarie's active ETFs now give you easier access to the global active investment expertise and strategies that were previously only available as traditional unlisted managed funds. Benefit from the transparency and convenience of an ETF structure underpinned by the global investment expertise of Macquarie's fund managers, which offer you additional options for portfolio diversification and the potential for index outperformance. Discover everyday access to active investments with Macquarie. Visit at etf.macquarie.com to find out more. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We are trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but those things that also work, and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients, that holy trilogy. So get set because... Myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained is general in nature, so here we go. For some time, ETFs have been synonymous with index investing. I do believe that's actually where they came from. However, recent innovations have shown that this is not the case, and ETFs are changing, changing every day. Uh, I think that I do believe last time I checked that a new ETF is being created every 22 minutes. Just made that up, but we'll get into it later. This episode, we'll explore the nuances and the underlying research processes driving these innovations. Joining me are two names to help us separate the wheat from the chaff. I once got a job saying that expression, it's hilarious, in the hunt for not only whether active beats passive um, or where the differences lie, but on which ones in an active sector are better. Matt Weichar, CIO for Asia Pacific at Morningstar, joins me to help steer the ship today. And it's going to be a, a bit of fun here because uh, I think that we're all pretty familiar with who we are, so it's good. Matt, how are you? Now? I'm good, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, Thank good. You. Thanks for coming in. And new to this show, one of my good friends in the market has has helped me uh, helped me greatly through uh, through my career, and probably over my career of doing podcast nonsense like this has been maybe one of my most common podcast guests in history. Um, but new to this show, ETF investment strategist at Macquarie Asset Management, Blair Hannon. Blair, how are you? Now? I don't know how anyone can beat that intro, James. It's, I do it really quick now, yes, don't I? It's very uh, it's intense, but we're here. Yeah. I just, I just go into it. People love my, sort of my, my nasal, like it's a nasal monotone, tinny sort of voice that comes through. Yeah. I'm not doing the misty yeah. calling of, of just a people. Of- <laughs> <laughs> I could do it really quick and that's and that's something. But I mean, it, it's hey, practice Practice does get you where you need to be. The, the more you do it, the better you are going to. And I think that probably if I could segue that to, you know, ETF management, portfolio management, then it, you may find a few similarities to it. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. And if you've been, well, if you're still not after a few years, then maybe you should just give it away. You're not someone who gives it away, nor are you someone who runs portfolios, but you are someone who knows an awful lot about the ETF space. I've always leaned on you over a thousand different things that we've done over our careers. I've always leaned on you for information. So, Blair, it's finally good to talk to you in this format. 
but everyone has to start the podcast the same way. And you get the same question. So, my friend, what do you do and how do you make money? Uh, look, I think everyone knows who Macquarie is. I don't think we need um, a, a true history of Macquarie. Uh, but I think for, for Macquarie and ETFs, it's, pretty, it's a bit of a new journey. So, look, it's not new in terms of we've been thinking about this for a long time, but for Macquarie, it's only been really since the back end of November 2023. So, it, it is pretty new. But Macquarie's been running unlisted funds for over 20 years. You know, Macquarie Asset Management yeah. certainly not. Um, a, a new business and, and a very well established business across both advice and institutional. Uh, so look, you know, it's a very exciting. It's a it's a foray, really. It's a very exciting foray for Macquarie to go into ETFs because it it is that next leap. Um, a very you know, being an ETF person, a very obvious leap for someone like Macquarie. And I think um, when we think about what they're doing, it is active. And this is, I guess, the topic of uh, what we're talking about today, and the difference between what that is and, to your point, synonymous with passive. But I think we're breaking down those barriers over time, and that's not just here; that's 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 globally. So it's look, it's a very exciting time. I think um, that's not just for asset managers; that's certainly for investors. It's for, it's for advisors yeah. to be able to access. They want to access anywhere, and that's that's the kicker, isn't it? If you want to buy it on a platform or you want to buy it on an exchange, that should be your call. Yep, and that's what we hope we can we can bring. Yeah, that's right. So, so you're the knowledge educating advisors getting those particular products more onto onto more platforms and and just spreading the word but also making them better as well. Well, I think there's a there's a there's a bunch of facets here. I think for Macquarie you can <clears throat> we can dive, dive into this for any for any active manager, traditional active manager, you can bring what you've always bought to the table and put it in a listed form. Yeah, that's great. Or I think this is where the, the where we need to start moving towards is what does that innovation look like for an active manager in listed space? And we can dive, dive into this later if you want. And, yeah. and there's a bunch of questions I think you you want to ask that sort of look into that space. But that's, I think, where where we know, you know, if you think about ETFs and the history, that essentially is a financial innovation. It's a tool that they got bought out many, many years ago. Um, and if anyone who's really interested in ETFs, there's a, there's a couple of great ETF books out there. Um, probably one of the best ones I've read is a book by by Robin Wigglesworth called Trillions, which sort of details the whole ETF history. Yeah, that is a good book. It's a great book. But, you know, the, the advent of active in ETFs is relatively new in that in, in that context. Um, so, I think, you know, we hear from advisors, we hear from investors that they want to, you know, they like both passive and active and and they want to access it in their own way. And, that, and one of those ways is listed. So, you know, we're, we're moving down that path. Yeah, yeah. So, um I think that the format for this one that we're going to go through, we've got a whole bunch of questions that have come from the advisor base as well. We've got you, Blair, just so that we've got some sort of an idea of what we're doing here. We've got you, Blair, who's the um, the Macquarie rep, but also extraordinarily knowledgeable in the ETF space to be able to talk to us a few things. Matt, more on the CIO from the portfolio management side, will be able to help us out, I guess, with where best things are best placed. So, Matt, I, I, I am going to kick this off with you and just say Morningstar – with their overall portfolios, what's what's their active passive sort of side that they have? I'd say um, in, in we we run you know managed funds and SMAs. We use ETFs. We use passive active, and I'd say it's probably you know maybe fifty fifty, maybe um, uh, maybe maybe even sixty forty yeah. in terms of you know. Uh, uh, ETFs versus unlisted funds at yeah. this point in time. Well, I'm going to ask the, the the most easiest the most easiest question. Look at me, grammar school. When would you find that the lean towards active is the most appropriate way to to to, to start heading in that direction? That's probably a question I'm going to be asking both of you. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the exposure that we're trying to look for. We run multi asset portfolios, so you know, in in um, equity space, we'll look for. You know, potentially, there's there's more alpha to be generated, so yeah. active manager might might be better place there if you're looking at areas like small caps or emerging markets that they'd be areas that you might want to look for for more um active in terms of um the bond market look we we just want duration at times so um we're, we're probably going to hold more passive exposure there as well and that's both blair and then we will get into one of the first questions that we've got there when when would a lean towards more of an active manager first off actually you know what let's just take a step back what is the difference between a traditional ETF and an active ETF? We haven't even set those frames yet. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Traditional ETF, geez, that that makes it sound like it's been around for hundreds of years. You know, we, we're, we're back in my day. thirty years, thirty years <laughs> of ETFs. But as we said, we said a couple of times now, ETFs are synonymous with passive. They are built on in, in, uh, unlisted index funds into into listed. And what are you getting? You're getting 
the good thing about like following a benchmark, following an index is you know what you're getting. You're getting an index, you're paying a, a small fee for that, and that's uh, really, again, another thing that's really synonymous with ETFs. Yep. Uh, or, or traditional, like in those, those core ETFs. Yep. So you so you might want ASX 200, you might want S&P 500, and the, the, the point is that the outcome you're getting should be the outcome of the index, and you're paying a small fee for that. So that, that is really important. That, that is a really core tenet of success for the ETF. I think if you combine that, knowing what your outcome is going to be, because you know, as an advisor, you're not going to get asked questions, how do we perform? We said we perform because we perform the index. That's what we intended to, to get out of this. And then it comes back to what you're talking about, Matt. It's the asset allocation that's, that's going right. to drive a lot of the performance overall. The second part of it is why, why and we've seen it significantly you know, in the US and definitely in Australia, is, is that cost is you know, at the core of what an advisor is doing is trying to lower cost from a client perspective. So that, that when you think about that, we can understand why passive and ETFs have done so well and why a bulk of the flows globally are going into passive. I think this is, this is the important part. Act, this active and passive debate, is, it's, just, it's ridiculous because active and passive, and Matt just talked about it, they're a combination. They're a combination in a portfolio. And obviously, Matt can talk to this much better than I can. But you know what? what you know, my background's been in passive uh, for a long time and now, and now I'm playing on the act, more on the active side. But every decision you make by buying Australian equities, by a weighting of – uh, whatever it is versus US equities is an active decision. You're just using a passive tool. So everything's active and essentially the passive is the tool to get there. Yeah. Passive is the tool to get there. So what what we're seeing is is the ability to, you know, build a portfolio with the combination of the two, depending on how you build core satellite, your barbell, whatever way you, that you think is the best way to build a portfolio, that's that's your call. Uh, it, the combination of the two is going to get you the best outcome. Yep. And how you use them, how you pair them, and how you weight them is what is what the client's actually going to see from a return perspective at the end of the day. So it really is about thinking: where is my opportunity to potentially beat the benchmark? And with small caps, whatever the ones you mentioned earlier, emerging markets, whatever that might be, where is my opportunity? Then I'm going to lean into active. If I don't think that that opportunity is there, then I can I can play in passive. Yeah, it's that it's that simple. Well, I don't think it's need to be overcomplicated. As you, as you mentioned, though, that's an active decision, which then sort of almost half negates the whole thing. And this is maybe where Morningstar might kick in. When, <laughs> when, how, how to make that active decision as easy as possible and as, and as, and as decision free as possible of when to be, of when to be going, okay, I reckon there's alpha here. I'm going to be, I'm going to be charging into, into active or I reckon I just need to play it safe or just need to just, just be the market for a while. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a really good active manager is going to, you know, be able to generate alpha over time. And, and you know, that takes a lot of skill, a lot of, you know, experience. We spoke about experience before, you know, and, and they've got a track record to demonstrate that. And and just by putting a, a wrapper around it, ETF or, um, you, you know, a fund wrapper, unlisted fund wrapper, doesn't make them a better or worse manager. The strategy is the same. And it's similar to, to passive, you know, passive, you know what you're going to get under the hood there. Um and if you want an exposure to UK equities and you don't mind, I'm just using UK as an example, and, yeah. and, and you, you, uh, you don't care for whether it's going to be, you know, you can achieve above benchmark returns or not, or there's not a good manager that you, you think's appropriate, then passives are a totally appropriate thing to put in your portfolio to, to capture that exposure. Yep. But at the end of the day, um, an active exposure, yeah, and Morningstar obviously on the research side do a lot of this. You know, you want to make sure that you're investing with managers that that can deliver e- excess returns over the long term. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Okay, so let's charge into the next question. What are the differences between? This is an interesting one. What are the differences? What are the differences between an actively managed ETF and an actively managed fund? How would you explain this to a client? You want to pick that up? It's pretty much. Just- yeah, look. No. There's, you know, if you think about it, there's a couple of core differences that for many advisors, it is a leap into potentially what they've historically always done, which is unlisted, which is just a fund and you know what you're getting, you're getting, you're buying it, you're getting into day nav, great, you know, you're paying a spread on the way in and, and that's that's very, very transparent. What we've seen enlisted though, is you can kind of get the best of both worlds. So, because that that scope of how many Funds is growing and growing. You know, it probably still isn't the amount is in the unlisted space, but it's growing significantly. Mm. Uh, your access to multiple asset classes and 
different areas is now significant. And whether that's pa- active or passive, the choices are all there. The ability though, and this is a couple of the core differences, the ability to, to go on exchange and know what price you're paying, to actually know what price you're paying. So when you buy an end of day nav, you, you don't really know if you're putting your order in and you're getting what you, what, what is set. Yep. You know that you're paying X, X amount because you put the order in and that's where it gets hit. Yep. I think the biggest nuance though, so that's obviously great for an, for an advisor. They can say to their client, we got X. But is the mechanics behind the ETF because there is that middleman, that middleman being a market maker where well, you don't have. So if you're buying an ETF, you're buying it off a market maker. If you're buying an unlisted fund, you're buying it directly from the fund manager. Yep. So that that is a nuance that, that I think um, many, many, now that now their ETFs are so, so large, um, are pretty comfortable with. But just to... to Sort of clarify this a little bit. That that market maker is independent in many cases, um, especially with an external market maker. They're independent. They're playing a role of providing the market to you as an investor. Um, they are working with the fund manager. Yep. Uh, but the fund manager doesn't dictate what that price is. But the the power of the market maker is is especially when there's multiple market makers. This is a really important point. Having multiple market makers in each product, yeah. each ETF, to create that pressure and arbitrage and keep that spread nice and close. You're not, you know, in that scenario, you're not going to get, and we've seen it significantly with illicit investment companies, a really, you know, large, potentially, no, I haven't seen many of the premiums to, to NTA, but very large discount. Yeah. So always, you're going to, yeah. So you, you're going to get in a situation where you know, and, and the other great thing is you can go on the website and say, hey, the NAV of the the ETF is X, so you go on any issuer's website. I'm going to go buy it on the exchange, and the and the prices between these these two um, these two prices, you know, it's if, if it's a ten dollar fund, it might be nine ninety nine, ten oh one, and you can then go, okay, the nav was ten dollars, I'm buying it for ten oh one, whatever, whatever. Um, and it's one example, yeah, one example. That's the that's the fee for entry. That's the fee for entry. That's the spread. So you know that you're doing that. That is provided the market maker doesn't move away from the spread. We've well, you've got this, you know, you can always talk, <laughs> talk to the issue in that case, I think. But that that is clear and easy to understand, I think, for many many investors to say, I'm paying that. That's what money I paid. Yeah. So I know what my entry point that's, is it's, at the point of, of of paying it. So I think that like, that is for, for many very powerful. I think the other the other part is just speed of execution. So you know your it's settlement is T plus two. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. Yep. And that's not a big deal for going in. It's a bigger deal for going out. I'm sure that's a, a, th- a thing for you guys when you're building yep. these model portfolios and SMAs. You want to be able to move when you're uh, when you're changing your asset allocation. Yeah, you want to be able to you want to be able to buy and sell pretty much at the same time. If you're going into one asset, one ETF, one one asset class, and selling another, downweighting another, rebalancing another yep. asset class, you want to be able to do that all pretty much instantaneously where you can. Yep. Um, make sure you know the cash is going to be there and those sorts of things. Unlisted funds make that a bit much more clunky on a platform for an, for an SMA. That's yeah. for sure. And and also, if you are judging something based on liquidity, liquidity does have to come into it. Definitely comes into it for us um, with yeah. people. It's always a question you need to ask. But def- definitely, in my last role of doing actual real personal advice and building actual structured detailed portfolios, was was one of those. When do you need what? And it's like, okay, ten percent of this I'll need within potentially three days if yeah. something comes up. 50% of this you can keep for a year and the rest of it is going to be for my grandkids. And that and that, that liquidity stuff really does kick into it. Yeah. So it means that, I mean, I, I didn't realize until actually just quite recently because I've I've come from an ETF place. I've come from a liquid a liquid side of things which is being more on the on the face, coal face advisory side that there's a huge difference between the liquidity. I didn't realize just how big that actual liquidity difference actually was in funds and how long it takes to redeem money out of a fund. And I'm thinking, oh, well, it just must surely be one, two, three days, and there may be some, and it's, it's more like seven days or something to actually get something across. I think there's two, there's two parts of that liquidity point. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hanging it on. Yeah, funds, no. just so that we're clear here. Okay, yeah. any, any, no, no. I was just saying, there's a difference that needed to be known. There, there is a difference, and look, there's a negative to to going on the exchange show, and that's brokerage. You, you are paying a fee to get in and get out. Mm, so true. understanding that that um, it's, it's not all positive. There is a there is a fee there. That may be about to be absorbed. That's 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 on the advisor's um, the advisor's choice. I think just just to clarify the liquidity point, because I think we get asked this question so much around ETFs. You've got to remember about liquidity. There's a, there's multiple layers of liquidity in ETF. So what you're seeing on screen is just the first layer of liquidity. The market maker themselves will hold a bunch of inventory of the fund that they can bring on screen. You know, again, talk to your issue if you have a large trade. 
they'll be able to then put more liquidity on screen that you can trade. Yep. But the real pool of liquidity, the real pool is the underlying assets. Mm. So if you're buying Australian equities, if you're buying US equities, that that is essentially not, it's not unlimited, but it's very, very, very deep. Yep. yep. To the point that a, a market maker can access that underlying pool of liquidity and increase their liquidity on screen. It might not show, and you want to, if it's not trading every day at huge amounts of volume, it's not like a share. It doesn't it doesn't have as that, that consequence. So knowing that you know that that pool of liquidity is there. Now, if you're buying, uh, and I don't know if there's a, a micro cap ETF, that is going to be less liquid yeah. inherently because the underlying is less liquid. Yeah. So I'm sure that's how you think as well when you think that's about. And then my market maker will have a wider spread for that. You, know, you have to pay for that liquidity. Yeah. You know, that, that's certainly something to be aware of if you're trading some more esoteric yeah. spread of ETFs. That's spread is cool. the cost. I'm yeah. going to take us back, Blair, get, get in your time machine and think back to when we were, we were, I think we were at a place together a thousand years ago, different jobs were there. And there was a, we we're at a conference. I'm trying to remember if you were there. We we're at a conference and it was an ETF that was talking that, that there was launching an ETF. And there was some question. It was a big planning, very, very big planning heavy sort of conference. This just sort of shows where the market was all those years ago that some of the planners were asking a question about the ETF and they're just saying, so hang on, so, so when we buy it, so what do we fill out when we buy it? And the, and the question, I don't know if you had to answer these questions. I think you might have had to, but it was, it was sort of very patiently, no, you just you just buy it. And it was that, that sums up the difference between the planning side and the advisory side in this, in this market of, well, when do we, what do we send to the fund? And it's said, no, no. It's on the market. Now, it's funny with ETS because this is an educational podcast, So, Blair, and, and you've had to explain this to me a while ago, that that the, the price of the ETF is as much driven by fund flow that's buying it as much as it is on the underlying assets that value it. Can you... Can you go into that? That if if there's if there's money that's actually moving an ETF, that's actually actually actively buying it. For example, I mean, let's use gold as 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 yep. an example, just as part of the education. Because I've got you here, I'm going to tap your brain for this good stuff. And I know that this is a gap in the market, and I want to try and solve this for people. Right? If there's actual money that's going into an ETF that's actually buying it, then the underlying has to actually then be bought too. Right? <clears throat> I think there's a couple of ways to sort of address this, and and the core of this question comes back to. Uh, I think our ETFs too big, which we mm, probably had this huge debate that raged, and it mostly was on the way out because, like, you know, everyone at the same door. Oh, is yeah, that a problem? The door gets small. Yeah. So, and look, we, in COVID, we saw. I, look, I think the, the it was proven in COVID that that's not the case. But you know, if you think about the underlying, so if you use gold as your example, if the weight of money is moving into the ETF, the flow-on effect of that is that the the asset manager needs to buy the underlying asset. Mm. That's they're holding it on behalf of the of the investor, and we and we saw that a little bit uh, with the recent Bitcoin launches in the US Correct. Uh, yep. of spot. So obviously BlackRock, that fund is now huge. They have to then go inherently and buy that underlying asset, yep. which has a flow on effect for the underlying asset because that's that's essentially demand. That's yep. demand. Yep. So think about it as just a throughput. It's just it's a look through to the underlying asset. In a case of US equities, it's not going to you know. These some of these US um, SP five hundred funds in the US are huge. They're they're four hundred five hundred billion dollar yep. funds. But again, you're probably welcome to say they're going to be moving markets in those smaller niche markets, as Matt mentioned. There is a flow on effect, and there was an example of this. Maybe call it four or five years ago. It was a uh, it was a US clean energy ETF that did actually due to the size of the ETF, and there was a really good amount of of alpha that was generated. You know, you know in terms of return, not alpha, but return. Yeah. Uh, that it actually had flow and effects with the underlying companies because some of them are quite small. Yeah. So it does. This is back to that liquidity point. So if, it, if it's really low liquidity underlying, there is likely to be flow and effects. Whereas if the underlying is very liquid, yes, you know, gold, you know, unless, you know, from an Australian perspective, we just don't have enough. The size of our market is not going to be big enough probably to move markets. But the US, you know, it's an $8 trillion market. There is potential there that in a Bitcoin, it will have a flow and effect. Um, I think Cathy Woods Arc ETF, the innovation one that yeah. you know, as people piled in there, as it you know, it was a bit self fulfilling the momentum there yeah, sure uh, a couple of years ago, and and you know, once the music stopped, it just yeah, you know, it was up two hundred and seventy percent down ninety. So the same thing kicked um, off, and it, but it, but it was self fulfilling because everyone's buying the ETF and, yeah. and pushing the pushing the underlying stocks higher. Once no one wanted the underlying stocks. The, the, the everything like everything sort of shifted, and then and then that narrative then started to become the story that was going on. These ones, are, these ones are getting hit, 
and it just yeah. yeah one after the other. Uh, funnily enough, I'm going to go off paste a little bit on this one. And Matt, this might be a good one for a CIO um, because recently I was at a conference and it was one of those one of those great conferences. We I think about 17 fund managers all came and spoke, and they all spoke about valuations. Um, they all spoke about diversification. They spoke about what their thing was. Everyone everyone gave their pitch, and they were all they were all amazing. But one of the things that really didn't get touched on was fund flow. That, that that we were talking about and I've got this theory that you know what you could you could have the best idea in the world but if the if there's no money flow into that particular area then what's the point because you're not it you, you're going to be out there on your own holding this thing and you don't have anyone anyone to back out how much does fund flow come into it for the decisions and, and, and it may be zero because of the way that you guys run things but do, do, you, do you keep an eye on it um look I think we you know, we have a bit of a contrarian bent to, to what the way that we think about markets. Like if, if liquidity is leaving an asset, then we start to get interesting because usually it gets cheaper. Yep. Um, and so fund flow is interesting from that perspective. You know, if, if everyone hates an asset, if funds are really flowing out, China and China tech over the last few months has been an example of that. Great. Um, yeah. And so we, we started to get a little bit more interested and because not much has to go right f- f- for, for the asset to do well from there. You know, small amounts of fund flowing back into the asset – um, can really push push the uh, the the uh, the asset around. So yeah. China Tech's case, not much has to go right. You know, a good growth number the other day, or a good kind of uh, you know it's a few numbers push the market around quite a lot. So so fund flows are important. Yep. Um, but it's probably a secondary measure to kind of thinking about the fundamentals. Yeah. I, I mean Blair. I mean you could be you could be a great active manager, but if there's no if there's no if there's no f- flow into your fund then it's it, it, how much harder does it make your life going on or do you just need your sales guys to go and do a better job oh inevitably but, uh, <laughs> that's a given but but no look i think for many uh, active managers performance is you know you live and die by performance yeah because you know that's the point well yeah. matt mentioned it earlier you know if you've got long-term performance you're going to catch the eye of not only just individual advisors, but you're going to catch the eye of large asset managers uh, like, like Morningstar. You're going to catch the eye of a lot of other people who are who are investing and want to access that alpha. But it, it does. It comes back to the long-term consistency. If you're, if you're outperforming one year, then underperforming the next year, well, no one's going to get too excited about what you're doing. But if, you know, and, and um, advisors inherently understand this at the core of what they do, but looking at, the results of just the one year aren't going to give you much. But looking at the results of three to five and 10, well, that's going to give you a much bigger picture of how have these active managers perform through. Now, 10 is not great because we've had a great run over 10 years. But, you, you know, if you can look back further than that and understand what the performance like has been through multiple cycles, you know, multiple market events, well, then you're in a much better understanding of all. Well, they'll be able to hopefully do this going forward. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's right. And actually, just if we can carry on with this one, what what would be a good way? What criteria should you be using to select a or to to separate the wheat from the chaff in the active management space? I'd say you know the people, the team, how long they've been together, you know, and and, and obviously their track record together, which dives into performance, um, which is key. You know, obviously that's a, a lag. Yeah, you know, we're talking sharp sharp ratios, or is it- well, yeah, I mean, yeah, risk adjusted performance is yeah. key, um, and I think that that. Um, you know that that's another pillar. Um, so people performance. You know the process. Like you want to have the consistent process. So if if it's a value manager or a growth manager, that's great. Are they doing what they say on the tin all the time? Because mm. you want to make sure that that their their uh, process is what you're after. You don't want them to be chopping and changing things. And then the other one, um, maybe a lesser one, is probably the parent as well. How, how stable is are they as an entity? Um, yep. You know, if you're talking to Macquarie. Then you know they're a pretty stable entity. They're going to be around. If it's a I've boutique, heard of before yes, yeah, you've so, heard of them before. Yeah, yeah. if it's a boutique, <laughs> um, yeah, they may be a great team. But what if they don't have the capital? To your point before, if no one wants to jump on board, then yeah. uh, then then maybe they're not as uh, you know stable an entity as as you're. Which after. yeah, which actually, I mean, for the purposes of it, isn't always the. It's it's not the most it's not the worst thing in the world if a thing has to sort of shut up shop. It just everything sort of just gets dispersed. It's okay. It's just a hassle. That's right. It's just a pain yeah. um, that you don't need on your portfolios, and your yeah. clients don't really need to go through that, especially if it can be avoided. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll usually check key, key person is a big one for me. Key person. Is yeah, definitely. you're sitting in a room and you talk to a whole bunch of people. You're just like, okay, so of all the people who are making decisions, it's this old guy. Yeah, and that's what they say about me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it is often one that, that that gets picked up. The key person side of things, yeah, size is important as well. 
Um, I think I think to add to that, add to that though, and I think you know the important stuff for our managers to be held to account, and and we are held to yeah. account by researchers, um, by model managers, you know, by, by a range of people, by individual advisors. So we need to be held to account that the to your point, what what we say we're going to do is what we do. That's right. And performance is one element of that. Mm. I think understanding also, and this is where we need to, you know, put it back a little bit on advisors, understanding what your expectations are, they're going to help you with your outcome. Yeah. Because if your expectations of what you're buying aren't correct and then you you think, oh, hang on, my outcome should have been X and I got Y, well, under, you know, actually taking a bit of responsibility and saying, well, what was I buying? I wasn't just going on to the Morningstar website, filtering for five star and that's yeah. what I'm going to buy as a, as a top ranking. That's not going to help you. I think the second part of that is understanding there is multiple ways that, I think managers run money now. So fundamental is one of them, key person risk. Yep. But you know, Macquarie, for example, has a really strong systematic team. Mm. Now that's again really key person, like the, but it's built on a model that is taking away that person's biases as as part of the element of the of the the process. So understanding what you're getting and how that process works, I think, is inherent to building proper portfolio. Now, if you don't want to do that, which is fine, outsourcing. To a, to so to got, another manager yep. is uh, like like a Morningstar, wherever you want to outsource to. Yep. Consu- the, obviously, the range of consultants these days is very large. That is a great solution. Yep. If you do want to take it on, that's where getting under the hood. And there's many advisors out there who lo- who love that and drive for that. And whether it's a stock, or whether it's a manager, or whoever it is, but just knowing where you want to spend your time, what the value output is for you for your clients. Yep. That's I think it's a really important part of the. Like, I think position. it's a. It's a Great points, and I think that the one around expectations, making sure you got the right expectations set correctly, because you you may go, okay, I want to go into this active ET global equities, active ETF, for example, um, systematic, fundamental, whatever, and then you keep looking at well, the 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 MSCI, Acqui, passive, active ETF keep, keeps going up, and this is lagging, and but but the point might be that you're going into it for a completely different reason, for better risk-adjusted returns that are going to pay off over time or something like that. You've got to really make sure that you know why you're going into something and not not get distracted, keep chopping and changing because that can get de- be detrimental to Because then clients. you're actively... You're, actively you're, becoming an active, you're becoming an active manager of managers as well. That's right. And unless you know how to run a fund of funds, you should probably stay as far away from it as possible. I came to that conclusion a long time ago. It seems to have worked for me so far. The less decisions that are made by... Advisors, because I, as far as I'm concerned, and this is a controversial topic here, so mark the mark the point in the podcast where I said this. As far as I'm concerned, most advisors should be really, really good at servicing clients and knowing what clients need, staying on the front foot with that, knowing about new products, changes in regulations, and changes in in the market that are relevant to the actual clients that they're doing, and less time actually trying to filter through picking out which funds or which funds they should or should not be a part of. It's it it. That there's things that advisors are really, really good at, and that would be actually talking to people face to face, knowing the intonations of clients' voices, facial expressions, to know what they're comfortable and uncomfortable with, and knowing the directions that they would like to take, and less time actually trying to pick out, you know, which particular active manager they want to have to be able to tackle the Chinese market. That's just my view, though. Oh, look, I think the good thing is, you know, if we think about how big the market is in Australia, let's say there's fifteen thousand advisors who do investment advice. As part of their their book, some have a value add of, you know, if you think about the segment that is more stock broking, mm. traditional stock broking, they have a value add of picking stocks or using research or you know core of their what their being is is investment advice. Mm-hmm. So you know those those guys, yes, are great at understanding what a client wants and now be able to articulate that in an investment portfolio. There's many advisors on the other other spectrum who want to outsource mm-hmm. to a Morningstar to whoever they want to outsource to because they know that they prefer to get broader holistic outcomes for clients. It, I think there's there's a spectrum here. The good thing for us as an asset manager is is we can help both ends of the spectrum. So we can talk to those advisors who want you know pick individual fund managers or we can talk to a Morningstar and say, oh, well, how can we help you with your overall portfolio you know, with solutions. So we're agnostic around how how investors want to run their business, but we just want to get them good outcomes from from the investment side. Yeah, true. There's, there's nothing worse than someone who just tries to jam the same product down every everyone's throat as well. It's it's, and I know that that's not what you do, Blair. So that's that's good. Um, uh, all right, let's blast through the rest of these questions. I realise that, that, that we're sort of off, as interesting as this has been. I've got to answer these questions, uh, otherwise I don't get paid. What asset classes can be accessed via an actively managed ETF? Wow, this is. Who wants to to you? I can start and then we'll pass it around. I think yeah. this is broadening. We know that 
I think from a, from a passive point of view, I, th- I don't know. I don't know the exact number. We're, we're getting in the mid three three hundreds for terms of, of total ETFs market. They're kind of running out of options around what they can emulate because they have to have an index. They've got to have an index to emulate. <laughs> I was right about the over 22 minutes and you one gets <laughs> Yeah. So, that, look, um, but they're just, you know, there's a lot of really quality indexes that are already taken. So, you've, your options are already out there. So, you, you know where you can go to gravitate towards that. Um, I think where where I sort of know, and you, you should mention this earlier, man, around, you know, fixed income duration, what, what you probably can't, what you don't get with a, a, a passive ETF in this space is any – you know, it's not dynamic. It can't move yeah. with the tide. Uh, where you, that's where you trust an active manager. So even fixed income, for example, and you want a manager to take that. You know, I'm an, if I'm an, uh, an advisor and I don't know, in, you know, exactly where I want to be duration wise. Well, that's where an active manager can help you. Yep. So you can you can outsource that to an active manager through an ETF and say, depending on what part of the market I want to be able to move around that duration curve or I want to lean into high yield or I want to lean into emerging market, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, so, that's what active is going to help you much more than a passive where you probably need to have multiples, combine them together to get your outcome that you want. And that's a really active, really active building. So, I think the other area that's probably, I think, you know, that's what where ETFs are going is more that, you know, they have, have that hands on the wheel mentality of, of what people allocate towards active. Where they're not going is alternatives. Yeah. You know, alternatives are a really big part of um, investors' portfolios these days. You need five years ago, it would have been under five now. It's around 10%. You might, might see this in your room, but they are better suited for managed funds. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, many alternatives probably lack a little bit of transparency. And that another one of the core tenets of ETS is transparency. Yeah. Um, but really, it is that, and we've laboured this point a few times, it's liquidity. It's whether you want the lock up or whether you want, you know, if you're an ETF, you need daily liquidity. That is the the core of your being is to be able to get in and get out whenever you want. We know with many alternatives, whatever that whatever that segment is that you're playing to, alternatives are such a wide spectrum. You're not going to get that in yep. many cases. So maybe you'd be had, very, yeah, you had be very cautious. Uh, yeah, it's someone offering an uh, alternative ETF, uh, ETF with a um, yeah. I, I, I ideas are here. And he was the CIO from another major broker as well, and a, a good guy. But I'm not hassling him. But I did hear the word liquid alts get mentioned a lot, um, and it was sort of just like that. That's that's where that's moving. And there's a bit of a question that I've got on this one as well. Of just like if there's a lot of there's a lot of selling in that space on that day, then those liquid alts. I don't know how liquid they're going to be. But that's just that's just me. It's in that one. But I mean, if you've got imagine that property property can be treated as an as an alternative. I mean that's. It's difficult to get that sort of liquidity, but we, we we won't go down that path. It's it. Um, is the is the investment process undertaken the same as a managed fund or different? I said this is going to differ. I mean, that's a pretty easy question, but I suppose we've got to answer them. I can take this first, and we'll pass it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah we, we have mentioned processes before. If you want to, get yeah, to that, I, I think yeah. at the at the fundamental of the manager's point of view, it's identical. Yep, there is no change. If you're entering uh, an ETF that is also an unlisted fund you are getting identical outcomes. It's run by the same manager. It's, it's forming exactly the same. Yep. There's a couple of different ways, you know, that that you can, as an ETF, get into to a fund. There's, you know, you can have what's called dual access. Um, you can have a feeder fund. You can also have multiple share classes that run in the same fund. And so, look, without going into all the nuances of that, essentially what you're getting is the same outcome as what you would get in an unlisted fund versus a listed fund. Just delivered differently. Yeah, it's it is whatever and you mentioned before. Like we talk about wrappers, like this is just the wrapper. Yeah, and that's all it comes down to. So I think at at the core of it, outside of the points we made earlier, things like potentially transparency, brokerage spreads, that the the, the investment process stays exactly the same. And you you would know that from your how you play into these. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, but we actually have an active ETF as well. It's a systematic strategy. It's just a feeder fund. You get exact. Someone wants a Mars bar, they get a Mars bar. Yeah, just choose a different wrapper. That's very. I'm actually. I'll talk to you about that afterwards too, Matt, because I'm actually looking at a few things. But that's uh, a personal conversation for my own uh, asset allocation. Uh, what should advisors look at when comparing ETF portfolios and performance? Hey, this is a good question. When comparing ETF portfolios and performance. So if you, if you, if you want, okay. So let's just say I think in the context of what this is being asked, you have a client that comes to you and they've got X amount that's in there and it's all in ETFs, and you know you get that classic one. How am I doing? You know, I need you. To, I need you to compare. I don't. I don't know, but this last advisor has been doing things. I want to go and talk to someone else. I want a second opinion on how this is doing. How do you immediately look at that and say, "Do you run it through running through a Morningstar magic filter, or is it 
Matt, uh, I'm going to go with you first. They're, they're, you, no, you got the most. You got the most alarm probably, on your face. So I'm going to go with you. No, first. it's probably the same. For, I mean, uh, for for a managed fund or a portfolio of managed funds as it is for 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 ETFs, you want to make sure that you know you've got a overarching multi asset kind of benchmark, a strategic asset allocation or something that you can compare it to. Yep. yep. Um, and then you want to go down to each of the asset classes and go, okay, is Aussie Equities how's that performed? in my portfolio versus, say, the ASX 200 or 300 yeah. or something yeah. like that, and then make your way through each of the, the different layers there. And if they're active portfolios, you know, are they benchmarked to the right? You know, this is what an advisor would be doing. Are they, is an active ETF, active managed fund, is it benchmarked to the right kind of um, yeah. uh, the underlying index as well? Yeah. And that's how you're going to see whether, you know, at a glance, whether this is doing, you know, well or not. So have multiple other layers you can get into there. Yeah. So have your have your have your ideal sector yep. analysis. And then what you said at the top of the show, which was like some sectors you want to make sure that you've got an active um tilt. Some sectors you want to make sure that you've got a passive tilt. And then sort of just go through and make sure that each of those each of those ETFs that's on there actually lines up and is yep. actually doing what it says uh, the the what it's supposed to be doing. Exactly. Which sort of sums up everything that we've talked about on this podcast. Yeah. And look maybe I can add <clears throat> as an as a as an aside if if you've got a client that's come to you, and for many, many years ago, I was back in the advice space for a long time, and we know if you've got a client coming to you and all they show you is their investment portfolio and says, can you do better? That's alarm bells for me. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> good starting. Yeah. Right. I do remember. Yeah. 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 Look, you do it. You as an advisor, as you know, are doing a lot more than just performance. Yep. There is such, it is, it is understanding that client at their core. It's helping them achieve their goals. It's, you know- Knowing what their you know, what their kids like, you know, it is it is very very different than just I'm just performing on an investment point of view. Yeah. It, and we talked about software because even for those guys and girls, that that is still not just exactly all they do. Mm. Now for Matt, that probably is all you do. So I, I do feel you because yeah. everyone's judging you all the time. That's but that, yeah, that's that's sort of the purpose different. of what they do. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, look, it comes down to I think two two things. It is you're building a portfolio in totality. How are those those different ETFs or different funds mixing together? Because they're going to give you, I think this is where many advisors probably struggle, is how are they combining, like what's your overlap? Yeah. If you've gone and got a NASDAQ ETF, but you've also got a very highly active manager that is focused on tech, you're going to have lots of overlap. Yep. So, are you looking at your portfolio in totality? Because just piling in another ETF that's doing well, is not going to solve any problems for you necessarily. Yeah. And I think that that is hard. I think Morningstar actually has some pretty good technology there, but that is a probably a technology problem that I think advisors need to, you know, pull it apart and put it back together and say, what does this look like for my client and how, do I, how am I running that? Yeah. But then it goes back to this point, and we've just got to bang the table on this. It's what are you buying and is that what's going to actually give you the outcome that you expect it's going to give you? So, if you're going to buy a systematic manager, but is that systematic manager got a growth bent or a value bent? Like, what, how are they building it? Or is it is it broad or is it is it a an enhanced product that is just trying to get you index plus like what what are you getting and then how does that package together with your overall portfolio to give you an outcome that's and that's what i guess professionals do do that's your only job is to build that and put it together that's right portfolio construction and making good decisions on behalf of clients is is our job yeah yes. yeah so i mean, so, so, so we've talked uh, I, I always hate the podcast where it's just like this is what you need to do um you know, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Rogers. It's the old know how to fold sort of situation. The advice that he gives, you got to know how to fold and know what, know when to fold and know when to hold. It's like, yeah, but you're not telling me when I'm actually supposed to be doing that. So that's where Morningstar comes in when it comes to yes, you need to be able to know if this ETF is doing what it's supposed to. How to do it? That's that's where Morningstar kicks in, right? Yeah, that's look, right. It's a, yeah. It, that's an inherently very hard job. Manager selection. How does it pair with the, all the other things you got in your portfolio, and then all the other myriad of things that an advisor needs to do to help a client. Yeah. Like you add all those things up and this is why we are where we're at is because it, that job is so difficult and time consuming and then costly how, you know, advisors having to have how many clients they can bring on in part of their book. So, this is where if that is something you struggle with, outsourcing is a great solution or if, that, if that's, that's part of your value proposition, how do you then scale that value proposition? So, yes. they're, they're the, they're the, that's the heart of what, we, what I think advisors are at the moment. Well, I think that we have managed to achieve quite a lot today. We've talked about when to use active, when to use passive, what's better in that, how to judge them, how to scale them, how to compare them, how to treat them, how to stay away from them, how know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Last bids, please, from either of you, and then I've got to close the podcast. 
Just just one last thing, yep. and then you know we put together these portfolios. We discuss it all day. We work with ETF providers and active managers all the time to to make sure that not only what we're putting in the portfolios is is appropriate for clients, but but you know we're going to get the scale and 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 that we've got good relationships as well. So so uh, we work with them all. Good, fantastic, Blair. Last from you. I would say, and I, I made this point earlier. If you're a financial advisor and part of your value property is to to work with investment managers, hold them to account. Yeah. But work with them, you know. I, I, get I don't think there's it. enough of that going on in the market. Never yeah, and understand yeah. what they're what they're delivering and yep. why they're delivering it and how they're delivering it. Yep. I think that Good will job. make you um, much happier with whatever the outcome is you're getting. That's right. That's right. And I have also found my last piece of advice. I mean, there's been some cracking advice throughout this one. The last piece is that if you want to try and get something done in an ETF, pick up the phone, talk to the guys. They will organise it for you. Especially if you've got a bit of size and you need to move some stuff around. Hundred percent. Don't go sitting in the market. I've 100%. seen it. I've seen it botched time and time again, especially yeah. if you're sitting there and you're actually using the values. Is that if you're actually using the values of those ETFs on your portfolio, someone comes in and completely ham fists the price of the thing and just throws everything off. Yeah. I can't stand it. I can't tolerate it. I've seen it done badly. Please do not be that guy. Uh, otherwise, you can't sit with us. Or girl. Well, whatever it is to say. Um, all right. That's it for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Matt Waitcher, CIO for Asia Pacific at Morningstar. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. And obviously, old mate, good on you, Blair Hannon, ETF investment strategist at Macquarie Asset Management. Thanks, Blair. Appreciate it. And you have been listening to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team. I thank you for joining us. Any more questions you've got, put it into the Ensemble platform and we'll be sure to answer them as soon as we possibly can. Have yourself a great day.